So uh, just a month ago here, I had the opportunity to, I was over in Kenya doing some work over there, and on the way back, um, I flew to uh, Ethiopia, and when I got to Ethiopia, uh, I got on a plane there, and I had to fly all the way back to Chicago, where I, again, got back to Minneapolis. Now, the jaunt from Ethiopia to Chicago, it's a 17 and a half hour flight. It was a long, miserable flight. And it was even more miserable. Last time I went with my friend Mike and I had COVID on the way back. So that was less miserable or it was more miserable. And we were in coach. And fortunately, Mike is not six foot five. So he had a little bit more comfort than me because Mike's over there. That's why I'm looking over there. You raise your hand, Mike. So people know I'm not talking to the wall. There you go. Okay. So anyways, <clears throat> this time I flew back business class. I'm telling you, that's a bomb diggity. My friend paid for the ticket. So I got to fly back business class. It was really nice. So I get on the plane, it's Ethiopian Airlines, it's all, you know, mostly all Ethiopians that get on the plane. And I'm sitting up uh, in the front, like the front row or second row in, up in business class. And, you know, I get on the plane, and, and I don't like talking to people on the plane, I just want to get to my destination, read a book, whatever, watch a movie. Uh, and we take off, and we had to land in Rome to refuel. So when you land on a long flight like that, you don't get to get off the plane. You just land, you stay on the plane, and they refuel it. So we landed, and all of a sudden, all these people wearing these bright yellow jackets, whole outfits came on the plane. They were medical people. Apparently, the woman just behind me uh, to my left had a medical issue. She was an elderly Ethiopian woman, and one of the flight attendants had called the medics because they couldn't wake her up. And so the medics all came on the plane, and I'm watching this, watching what's happening in... Uh, and they, you know, they, they're kind of whatever, move around the family. It looked like anyways, like there was a man in front of her and a man behind her. There's room. You have business class. So you can actually walk a little bit in, in between the aisles. And they're arguing in English now with these, uh, uh, the medical people saying, she's fine, she's fine, she's fine. And they sort of got her to move. Like she lifted her head a little bit. And then, uh, then she went back, lay down again to go to sleep because uh, they're almost lay flat seats. And finally, the medical people gave up, said, fine, whatever. And it was kind of a coarse goodbye. Like, they just left. Like, whatever, you're taking this in your own hands. So we take off from Rome. And I don't know, nine hours later, eight, ten, whatever, I'd lost track of time. I'd been flying so, so much. Uh, but I know that we were over the ocean somewhere. We hadn't even reached Canada yet. And all of a sudden, over the speaker, they spoke something in Ethiopian. And since I'm not very good at Ethiopian, in fact, I speak almost no Ethiopian, except for saying Ethiopia, which is Ethiopian. Anyway, so, so we, uh, uh, then they spoke in English. They said, any medical personnel come to the front of the plane immediately, if you're able. And uh, sure enough, two, two, only two people in the entire plane were in the medical field, and they were nurses. One, I think, was like a nurse in training or something. And they came to the front, and they pulled out a oxygen from the tank that they have on the plane, and the medical kit, and they're trying to get her pulse, and... And, and they're, they're trying to work on her. And I felt this nudge from God say, go over there and help. I said, no. <laughs> if God ever nudges your heart to say some, to do something and you don't do it, you feel really kind of dumb when you tell God, the God of the universe, no. Like I felt him say, go. I'm, uh -uh, I'm tired. I don't like talking to strangers. Like, what if they hurt me, you know? Elderly woman, totally kidding. So anyways, uh, I felt God say, go, go, go say something. And I said, okay, I will. So I, I got up out of my seat and walked kind of around the back and walked over. And there, there was a woman, turns out her name is Enti, who was there. And she was, she was crying. And she had her hand on this lady's shoulder. And there was another guy in front looking at her, kind of distraught. And to me, she looked mostly dead. Like... She definitely didn't look mostly alive. She was mostly dead. And I said, uh, uh, I, I'm a chaplain. Are you a Muslim or a Christian? She looked at me funny. And she looked at me and I said, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a pastor. She goes, oh, I'm a Christian. She spoke fluent English. And I was like, oh, I said, can I pray for your, your, is it your grandma? She said, no, that's my mother. I have a hard time telling ages, especially in that condition um and uh she's crying she's like yeah that's my mom i said well i'd like to pray for her. 
and she, I, have, I put my hand on like her shoulder and she just grabbed it. I'm on one knee beside her. And, um, and I started praying. And you never really know how intense you pray until you need to pray intently and intensely. And I prayed and I cried out, God, I just, God, would you show up in this woman's life? God, we need you now. And the nurses are trying to work on her. They still can't get her up. Uh, and then uh, I'm, I'm, I'm almost done praying. I say, amen. And the woman moves. Like she, she lifted her head. I'm not saying she was dead. She was mostly dead. Because <laughs> I'm not saying that there's anything about my prayer. This is all about for the glory of God. I'm saying that we prayed and God answered that prayer. And, uh, and, and then she was mostly alive. And then the daughter was like, oh, thank you, Jesus. Like, thank you. She's a vocal. And the guy in front, there's like a sign of relief. I hadn't talked to him yet. It turns out it was her older brother, this lady's older brother, that I'm praying with, and it was their mom that was not doing well. And, uh, and then I felt the Lord kind of nudge me again and said, go talk to him. So I got up, I walked around, and I, I said, hey, you know, I'm, I'm a pastor. And he goes, oh, I'm a pastor too. He goes, I pastor in Oregon. And he's fluent English. He's like, I pastor in Oregon, an Ethiopian church in Oregon. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. And I said, I have a friend, my, our sister church in Minnesota, we have an Ethiopian sister church, and my friend's a pastor. His name's Slushy. He's like, Slushy, I know Slushy. Like, <laughs> what are the odds, you know, meeting this guy? And uh, he said to me that, you know, because you're talking, you have nothing else to do, and you're still in flight. And he says, there's 27 people in my family, and now we are all Christians. Only my mother is still a Muslim. She's the only one. And uh, I didn't say it to him then, but I was hoping in my heart that this woman in her state would see the man in white because that's how many Muslims are actually coming to faith that are having visions of Jesus, the man in white. They all tell these stories. So anyways, uh, I, I talked to him and then I said, well, let's pray. And remember, we're in the airline. I'm standing up next to him. There's flight attendants all around and we're arm in arm. We got one hand pray. We're just praising God for what he's doing in this woman's life. And, uh, and after that, uh, you know, we shook hands and he told me his name, which I promptly forgot and not on purpose, just because I can't remember names. A lot of you know this because I call you by the wrong names unintentionally. I'm like, hey, have we met before? Yes, last week. I'm like, oh, sorry. So um, I forgot his name. But anyways, the, the plane lands and uh, or before we land, we had like an hour and a half left in the flight. And while we were still traveling, I would look back at the woman who was here she still had the oxygen on her mom. And I would look at her and she would smile at me, like with this big smile, and give me the thumbs up. And I would give her the thumbs up like good. And I did that about every 10 minutes for the remainder of the flight. We landed in Chicago and the medical personnel quickly came and brought her off the plane. And the family left and I said my goodbyes to them, waited till they were all off the plane and then uh, I embarked. And I, I haven't heard anything from them since. But I certainly lift them up in prayer on a regular basis. So why did I feel led? Why was I prompted to go pray for this particular woman at that particular moment? It's because I was looking for the one. I was looking for the one. Let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we come before you this day and we thank you that you give us an opportunity to work with you, that you use us for your glory, simply to point people to Jesus. God, we love you and we praise you. We give you all the glory in your holy name. Amen. So when you look for the one, it could be your neighbor, it could be a friend, it could be a complete stranger, someone you've never met before, but you're looking for that one person who God lays on your heart that you know that God is working in their life, but he's using you to somehow point that person to God. And it's a conscious effort that every disciple should do. We should always be looking for the one. And honestly, I don't think I have for the majority of my life, but I read a book called Looking for the One from my friend David MacGyver. He wrote this book. It's an awesome book. You can get it on Amazon. Hopefully we'll have copies here for you as well. It's called Looking for the One. But this series, uh, certainly his book has been a massive source of inspiration, but we're going to look in the, in the gospel of Luke at different stories where Jesus is looking for the one. And he has these interactions with this one person time after time after time when he, when he sees them 
And then he, being God, touches them and their life changes forever. So the gospel of Luke, you know that Luke wasn't an apostle? He wasn't an apostle. It's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. He's the only one out of the gospel writers that was not an apostle. In fact, he wasn't even Jewish. He was a Gentile. A Gentile means not Jewish. So just so you know, for clarification. And so all of you here, unless you're Jewish, would be considered a Gentile. And uh, he was a Gentile, but he was a physician. So when you read the Gospel of Luke, that's why you see, see all of these stories where he is caring about people. He seems to give more detailed accounts than other Gospel writers. Matthew, he was Jewish. He's all into the Jewish history. You have John, all about the deity of Jesus. Then you've got Mark, who's a good Jewish writer, uh, just gave us the nuts and bolts, the facts. And then Luke, you see the human side, a lot of the human side on, on him, talking about these different events that happened and gives us really great uh, detail. Well, we're going to launch a series looking at Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. So if you have your Bible or smartphone, you can open it up, or you can look at it on the screen because it'll be up there for us to read, uh, or at least you can see it as I read through it. And in this parable, it's a familiar parable because Jesus is talking about looking for that lost sheep. He's talking about looking for people. You. And me. It says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. Let me pause there for a minute. The tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. So it says, tax collectors and sinners, they were lumped together. I mean, just like now, they hated tax collectors back then too. So if you're a tax collector, we're glad you're here. We love you. But, uh, but generally speaking, you're not liked. I'm just saying that. just is a reality. <laughs> But, but we're different, but everyone else doesn't like you, but we do. So anyways, <laughs> moving on. So uh, the tax collectors, the reason they were hated so bad is because if the Romans charged $100 a year for tax, the tax collectors were able to keep anything they could get above that $100. So say you lived in Norway during America and your tax was $100, well, they would charge you $125. So every $100, they keep $25, but put in their pocket. If you lived in Waconia, it was $110. If you lived in St. Bonnie, it was $140. So it varied from place to place, tax collector to tax collector. That's why they were hated, because they were opulent, wealthy individuals, basically because they had extorted money from people. So they were despised by the Jewish people and the Gentiles alike. And then the sinners. The sinners weren't necessarily just the murderers and evil people. They were people who were not Jewish. They did not follow Jewish laws. So they didn't dress like the Jewish people. They didn't eat like the Jewish people. They ate things like, well, pig, pork. Uh, they, they did things like uh, Netflix and chilled, even though they weren't married. So uh, they would do that. They, would, uh, they, they might lie or cheat. They might, uh, they might be proud or arrogant. So they might be selfish. They certainly didn't give to God. And so they would be called sinners. Basically, it's all of us, every single one of us. And what's interesting is that these people were the ones that were hungry for God, and the very people that were supposed to be religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders of the day, it would have been the priests and the pastors, the ministers and the bishops, if you want to equate it to our time. They were the ones who were really not interested at all and these sinners, they were actually offended by them because they thought they were better than them. So they were never looking for the one. They were always looking out for themselves and only for the righteous people. Jesus had the most problem with these individuals because they thought they knew God, but their hearts were far from him. So it goes on. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered. So these are the people that are supposed to be religious leaders and now they're grumbling. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. He was directly confronting their thoughts and words in the moment. See, the Pharisees thought they were too good. They didn't need to repent. 
the sinners were so hungry for God. And Jesus really tells both of them at the same time that God loves them so much that he is willing to pursue a relationship with them. God says, we will leave the 99. In other words, we will leave this church community, this church body, and we will go out into our workplaces. We will go out into our communities and we will reach the one and there will be much rejoicing in heaven. You know that everyone who repents and comes to faith in Christ, including yourself, there's huge rejoicing in heaven. The angels rejoice when you gave your life to Christ. There was a party in heaven. They were rejoicing. There was great joy in heaven. When you gave your life to Christ, the angels were singing, yes, God, glory to God in the highest. Simply because you gave your life to Christ. And so when one person gives their life to Christ, whether it's here or anywhere else in the world, all of heaven rejoices. That's a wonderful thing. So God says that we should be looking for the one. The parable of the lost sheep, looking for the one. Jesus says, go and make disciples. That's looking for the one. That's making disciples. This picture right here just grabs my heart every time I see it of Jesus running after that lamb who clearly looks like that lamb is in danger, lost, or confused. And in the back is Jesus. You know that when you were that lamb, Jesus pursued you. He pursued you. He came down from heaven to be in this earth to pursue you, to reveal his heavenly father to you. Jesus pursued you. So how do we look for the one? If we're supposed to look for the one, how do we do it? Is there any kind of a pattern? Yes, there's a pattern. First thing you need to do is pray that God will use you to find the one that you should talk to. That's an honest, heartfelt prayer. You need to pray that God will use you to reach the one. So we pray, we ask God to help us to reach the one. For probably seven or eight years, no, six or seven, somewhere, I don't even remember. I pray this prayer every single morning that I remember to, and I should say most. I put my feet on the ground. I say, Lord, search my heart. Show me your ways and use me for your glory. It's right out of Psalms. Search my heart. Show me your ways. Use me for your glory. I pray that because I want, I want God to use me for his glory every day. But now I've also added to that prayer, Lord, help me to find the one. See, when you find the one, you're going to know it. You're going to know it. That's our our second step here. So we pray that God will use you. Second, look for the one throughout your day and respond when you find them. Okay, how many, don't raise your hands. How many of you remember the first time you fell in love? Like, don't raise your hands. I'm just saying. Don't raise, because for me, it was my wife. There's no one before her. You don't need to know anything about that. (laughs) Because she's watching. So, it's only (laughs) Kathy. But I remember when I fell in love, like, you know, you, you, you see the person, and I'm a guy, so I'm visual, right? So you're kind of like, do, 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 woo. <laughs> you know, it's a second look, and third and fourth look. And anyways, I'm like, wow, she's attractive, you know? And, and I liked her personality. She was fun. And the more I got to know her, the more I liked her. And then you just one day realized, man, you're in love. Like, you, like that, she stood out to me out of all the other people I saw that were average. She stood out to me. You know that feeling. If you've, if you've ever fallen in love, you know that feeling. They stand out to you. It's like there's a whole crowd, but that person matters. When you look for the one, God will lay that person in front of you and you'll be like, that's the one. Not, in, not, not talking a relationship thing, but it doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman. If you've prayed throughout your day, you've said, Lord, reveal that one person that I should talk to today. God will reveal that person to you. He will, he will show you. It's like they will just... There will stand out. There'll be something that, that you know that that's God pulling on your heart like that's the one. Like God's pointing his finger. That's the one. That's the one right there. That's, but you're like, God, I don't want to go. God's like, that's the one. You prayed. That's the one. But I don't know what to say. God says, I'll give you words to say. He says that in his word. Whenever you're asked, you, you, God will give you words. He will give you some sort of common ground to talk about. This last week I was down uh, working on my... 2009 Chrysler Town and Country minivan. I hate that thing. Because <laughs> I can't get it to work right. Like it just, it was only an oxygen sensor according to the guy who I bought it from. Well, he was wrong. So I ended up taking the whole motor apart. I had the heads off the engine. By the way, I'm not a mechanic, so don't ask me to fix your car. So I got the heads off the engine 
and I took him into the machine shop, had a machine, bring it back, uh, and, I, and I'm, I'm going to the parts store to get parts. And I open the door, and there's a lady there named Daphne. She's got a name tag on her. Her name's Daphne, and God says to me, she's the one. Like there was a nudge in my heart, like she's the one. I don't know why, but I just felt she was the one. There was no one in the store at the time, and, and uh, she sent my parts that I had ordered on the counter, and it was for a Cadillac. And I'm thinking, I wish it was a Cadillac, but it's a Chrysler. Because they both start with a C, but nonetheless, they're different. This one has eight cylinders, mine has six. So I'm like, that's the wrong part. She goes, oh, I must have pulled the wrong one. Well, let me look up, see if we have yours here. And she types on the keyboard and she turns to me. And I notice when she's typing on her arm, she has a tattoo. Now, I'm opposed to tattoos, so don't, don't think anything. <laughs> but on her arm, she's got this tattoo, totally kidding, that's arrows. They're all pointing. like They look like arrows that are all pointing in four different directions. And an X on her arm. And I said, uh, what does that to- tattoo mean? She goes, you know, it means I'm lost and I can't seem to find any direction. And I said, huh, that's interesting. I said, this one I have on my left arm. I said, this is a clock with no hands on it because it means that we don't know the time that we're given. Every day is a gift and I'm reminded of that daily as I look at my own arm. And then uh, we, we talked a little bit more about car parts and things and then and then uh, she showed me another tattoo she had. It was on her ankle. She lifted up, put her foot right on the counter. <laughs> like, had a tattoo on her ankle. And it, it said something I can't repeat, but then the other initials were E.T., which stood for eat trash. And that, that was a literal trash because I learned from her that she used to ride the trains up and down the West Coast. She was in a jug band. Anyone ever heard of a jug band? Yeah, me neither. Apparently one person, two maybe, they blow in jugs, you know, like an old jug. You blow in the jug, and it's, she was a street performer is what she was. It just so happened, I say divinely, that probably two weeks earlier, I had watched a video on YouTube of the Spoon Lady. Anyone seen the video of the Spoon Lady? Okay, yeah, a number of you seen the video of the Spoon Lady. Who knew? Why I got there, I don't know, but she plays spoons. That's two spoons together, and it's apparently impressive. And that's a half hour of my life. I'll never get back, but I did watch that show. <laughs> Anyways, so I tell this lady, I said, oh, I said, I just watched the spoon lady on YouTube. And she goes, oh, I know her. And she went into her name. She's like, I played with her several times. And so we had another conversation. And so we found that common ground, and, and we're talking about it. Anyways, then, uh, then before I left, I said, I said, um, uh, I said, Daphne, you keep searching and you're going to find direction in your life. I know that you're going to find the direction that you need to go. And she's like, oh, thanks, you know. And then the phone rang and I left. The point isn't that I led her to Christ. The point is that I had a spiritual conversation. I was looking for the one. I was looking for the one to just give her a little bit of direction so next time she looks at her ink, she'll think about that. Like, what direction am I going? And I'm going to trust that God will use that moment combined with another moment to ultimately reveal himself to her in some way, shape, or form. When you think about it, you came to Christ not just because of one person, but there was a series of events that happened in your life. If you look back on it, there was a series of events that happened where you look back and and it was one thing after another after another. And finally, like the lights came on, you gave your heart to Christ. I look back at my own life and I think about that and there was probably at least six people probably more, six that I could think of, that somehow I had an interaction with. I wasn't a Christian yet, but they, I remember one guy I rode around with because I, I was a police officer at the time in the Air Force, and I, he was a Christian. He talked to me about his faith. I'm like, oh, great, whatever. You know, but he, was one, he talked to me about it. And then there was another person that mentioned something and another person that mentioned something, and I look back on it, and they were all links in this chain. They were all people who just had a little spiritual conversation with me. I was the one. And if you're a believer, you are the one. At some point, someone said something to you that just helped you on your journey. So when we pray we're looking for the one, it means that you get to be a link in that chain. In some way, shape, or form, when you get to help nudge someone a little bit closer, because when God reveals the one to you, it means that God is already working on their heart. You just have to be obedient and step up in faith. So once you find the one, 
and you have a conversation with the one, again, it's not like you're going to whack them with the Bible and say, repent, you sinner. You know, that, that confrontation evangelism has never worked in my lifetime that I've seen. It just doesn't seem to work. But what does seem to work is when you actually point people to Jesus in some way, shape, or form. And the third thing that we do is this. We simply pray for the one that God placed in your path. So like, I don't know what happened to that lady on the plane. I have no idea. I don't know what happened to her, but I prayed for her often. And I prayed that in some way, because I gave them both my cards, that in some way that I'll find out what happened to their mother. Because I'm curious, but I set that in the hands of God. And out of all of the people in the family, maybe she gave her life to Christ since then. I don't know, but wouldn't that be glorious? And what about Daphne? I don't know. Will I see her again? Probably because I'm working on this dumb car. So we'll probably have another conversation. Because now, and I asked about her tattoo or about the spoon lady, maybe I'll watch another video on people who blow in jugs and make music. I don't know, but we'll have a conversation. And I don't know what God is doing in her heart or in her life. I don't know, I just have to, have to trust that. So once we find the one, once we connect with the one, we get to pray for him. And really, this is what we are called to do as disciples. Jesus says, they will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. He also talks about loving our neighbors, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. The neighbor doesn't mean the person who lives on the left or right of you in your apartment, townhome, trailer house, or or home. It doesn't make any difference. Your neighbor, in a biblical sense, is people that you come in contact with. The greatest way that you can love them is simply to care for them like Jesus. So we love like Jesus. We care like Jesus. We show concern like Jesus. We show empathy like Jesus. We show compassion like Jesus. The whole time we are bringing life to that individual. As a church, we exist. Our vision is we bring life. I want you to bring life wherever you go because that's what Jesus tells us to do. So here's my, my, my question for you. And it really is a challenge here as I wrap up. But it's this. I'm going to ask you, will you, not only raise your hand if you're serious about this, will you pray? at least during the series, every day that God will reveal the one to you. Now, you might not have that every day. I mean, there's been days when I don't, that, like there's no one, I just, I don't feel led to talk to someone. But more often than not, there is someone. So I'm gonna ask you, will you commit? Like, will you commit to saying, Lord, help me to find the one today? If you'll do that, just raise your hand. I'm gonna pray for you now. If you're willing to do it, if you're not, I understand there's a lot of peer pressure here because people have their hands up. But if you're willing to pray for the one, put your hand up. Okay, that's good. You put your hand down. I want to pray for you now specifically that God will put the one in front of you. And here's the thing is that when you pray that prayer, and those of you that raised your hands, you did just now. We're going to pray. When you see the one, you will know it. And when you know it, you'll be prompted. You'll be like, oh, that's right. I prayed that prayer. <laughs> And then you say, no, God, I pray someone else will be the one. Like, no, they're not going to have a shirt on that says, tell me about Jesus. They're not going to have that. You're going to find the one in the most interesting places, on a plane, at an auto parts store, in a coffee shop, at school, but you will find the one. So I'm going to pray now that you will find the one. Heavenly Father, I pray for those that raise their hands that truly want to find the one. God, may we make disciples by pointing people to you. It's for your glory, not ours, God. And I thank you in advance for using us to reach people for Jesus. God, it is such an honor and a joy to be used by you for your glory. It brings us great joy in our heart, great joy in my heart, God, when someone moves a little bit closer to you. But I pray today, for those specifically that raise their hand, that you will put the one directly in front of them today. Starting now. God, I thank you for using us for your glory. We give you all praise in Jesus' holy name. Amen.